You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal-making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not and, as um, simple you know, I, as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened so, up so many you know, more doors. The show is called The, the deal. deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Well, all right. Looks like it's another day, folks. We did it. Goodness gracious, we did it. Well, I guess there's uh, nothing left to do but to get into it. Why don't we go ahead and take a quick lap around the NFC North real quick, just get a couple of the news and notes out of the way here. We will start off with the Detroit Lions. Uh, Apparently, Jameer Gibbs is injured already. Lions' uh, top 10 running back pick. It does sound like it's a minor ankle injury, but um, certainly not a great start for, um, again, what what I presume to be one of the worst picks of the draft. (laughs) Usually, I don't like to say stuff like that, just because you never know how stuff's going to pan out. But what is the worst case scenario for me saying that? What is it? What, he's, he's going to be like Dalvin Cook? whoop de frickin do what, what did Dalvin Cook do to the Green Bay Packers, really? Was it that big of a deal? What's he going to be, David Montgomery? Saquon Barkley? I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to list top names that even are, are who, like Melvin Gordon. Who cares about any of these guys? Who cares? Ezekiel Elliott? Ooh, watch out. Look out, everybody. It's Ezekiel Elliott. Leonard Fournette. Oh, scary. And that's if he's just way better than anybody thought he was going to be. So whatever. Maybe he's Barry Sanders. You never know. I don't know. Everybody look out. Jameer Gibbs is Barry Sanders, everyone. But yeah, his ankle hurts. Speaking of, apparently he was asked about that, and his response was, uh, I don't care. So I'm glad because the feeling is mutual. Uh, meanwhile, new quarterback Hendon Hooker sent a message to all his doubters at the presser today. He said, quote, it all just turns into fuel. It turns into a chip on my shoulder. All this, oh, his leg is hurt. The film doesn't lie. I'm the F at the SEC Offensive Player of the Year for a reason. Hendon Hooker is just spitting fire. Hendon Hooker, by the way, is, is not participating in uh, actual practice. But it sounds like he's a, the, the rumor is he's a great leader. Going around dapping people up and stuff, dude. It's going to be so good. I liked Tendon Hooker until he went to the Lions. Now I'm just going to dog the guy constantly. As for the Vikings, we mentioned the uh, trade of Zadarius Smith to the Cleveland Browns, which cleared up some cap space and and got rid of somebody from the locker room that didn't want to be there. But that certainly isn't the end of the drama, and it's not just their running back that still has to be determined. It sounds like from what it, you know, sounds like Cook is going to be cut. Unless they can find somebody to take him in his contract, but that's probably not going to happen. But that's not the end of the situation. They've also got additional contract situations. Daniil Hunter apparently is looking for a new contract and has not arrived at um, voluntary workouts. Now, I know, I know, Vikings fans, calm down. It's just voluntary, and of course they're going to work something out, you idiot. Okay, great. I just want the full picture to be seen here. Daniil Hunter is not there. Zadarius Smith says, I want off the team. Dalvin will not come back for a pay cut, and the team doesn't want him back, and so he's staying away. Presumably, he's going to be cut. Justin Jefferson is not there. This is kind of a big deal. But that's not the only situation. I think there is a genuine question of whether or not Daniil Hunter, um, well, 
I don't even want to say it, it sounds so crazy to say whether he gets signed or not, but you know, you've got a new GM, you've got a new defensive coordinator. We've already learned that his production falls off when you change to this sort of hybrid three four four three system, right? So he's not a he's not the right fit. Twenty eight years old and has an injury history. Your GM clearly is in a tear down rebuild mode, but you know, this is kind of a middle ground. I mean, he's he's not young, but he's not old. But how much money is this guy gonna ask for and are the Vikings gonna cough it up? And at what point will they cough it up? Is this gonna drag on through the season? And into next season, will Daniil refuse to play? Where does this end? And by the way, this is all going on while Justin Jefferson is sitting out waiting for his contract. So whereas you say, well, obviously Daniil is going to get his contract. Dude, Daniil and Justin Jefferson are probably looking for $30 plus million plus in, in money per year. So when you look at the price tag that Justin Jefferson is going to get, and then you got Daniil saying, hey, I want that too, with all the things that I just laid out, as far as, again, 28 injuries, maybe not exactly a great scheme fit, are you really going to pay it? Should you really pay it? It's one of those situations as a Packer fan where you sit here and say, I think I'm okay with either situation. The Vikings are mid-rebuild, and two $30 million contracts, and maybe Daniil doesn't get quite that, but call it 31 and 25, 24, 22, whatever. In the midst of a rebuild, I mean, you don't even have a quarterback or anything else, and you, you, you're going to be cash-strapped, cap-strapped in that kind of a way. Makes it so that when you eventually go out and get that rookie quarterback, you're not exactly flush with cash. Anyways, the final note is, as far as that uh, Zadarius thing, there was also, uh, not only did they get very little compensation in return, I, th- I think it was, what was it, two-fifths for a sixth and a seventh? But apparently the Vikings are going to be paying a portion of Sedarius Smith's salary. And although I don't ha- have the, um, the numbers, it looks like it might be a substantial amount. The Browns had very, very little money. So it, it's a weird situation to think that they couldn't get a better deal for Zadarius Smith than you still pay for him and you give him to us and we're going to give you garbage. Anyways, uh, as for the Chicago Bears, not a ton going on. I mean, everybody's got their camps and everybody's got a bunch of insights, with the exception of the Packers, because everything's closed off. But um, everybody else has got some fun little insights about how everybody's doing and everybody looks good. And yeah, it's stupid, but I'm also just jealous because I wish we had some stupid stuff to report. But we don't. But I did find, speaking of stupid, um, the dumbest article of the day via SB Nation, WindyCityGridiron.com via Bill Zimmerman, the article, Are the Green Bay Packers Quietly Tanking? Tanking. I, I, I'd love to answer that before we even get into the article, but I, I guess we'll, we'll get into what he's trying to say first. It certainly seems as though the implication would have to be that we don't want Jordan Love at quarterback, right? Although that's actually not true because Bears fans believe that the Bears did tank with Justin Fields in his second year. Um... So there's that, but that's just because they're dumb. Anyways, he starts off the article by uh, acknowledging that Packer fans may find it and blah, blah, blah. But he says, before you go any further, ask yourself this question. What is one thing the Green Bay Packers did since the conclusion of 2022 season to improve their chances of winning games in 2023? The answer is nothing. The Packers let every key free agent walk and didn't bring in anyone of significance to the roster this year. So an 8-9 team from 2022, before we even discuss quarterback, has the has a worse roster now than it did then. So lots of issues here. Let's start with the part worth. how do we say that the roster is worse now? Because he said, because we, we can even forget the quarterback discussion. He says, before we even discuss quarterback, has a worse roster now than it did then. What got worse? Maybe tight end, but probably not. We didn't really have good tight ends, and we drafted two. The receivers, I would doubt, got worse. Running backs didn't get worse. Offensive line didn't get worse. Defensive line improved. Linebackers are exactly the same. Corners didn't get worse. The only thing that maybe got worse is safety, but that was such an abysmally horrible unit last year that if anybody with a pulse steps on the field, I feel like we're okay. I don't know what you're talking about. And this, I mean, this doesn't even really address the, the first paragraph where you asked, um, what is one thing the Packers did? And you said nothing. Well, they had 13 draft picks. 
They didn't just accidentally get 13 draft picks, by the way. There was an accumulation. You don't just accidentally stumble into 13 picks. But but let's let's get to the real meat of this. What did the Packers do? Nothing. I mean, we did just sign a safety, but let's just pretend that that's nothing. They let every key free agent walk and didn't bring in anyone of significance. Name one player of significance that the Packers should have and could have brought onto the roster. Go ahead and take a quick look at how much salary cap space we have currently and tell me which player should have been brought into this team that would have made such a significant difference that it that it makes the difference between tanking and having a real legitimate shot of winning um what i don't know playoff run or, or something he goes on to ramble about if the packers are confident in love they would have picked up the option and not hesitated why why do you think that it doesn't make any sense Let's say they are 100,000% positive he's the next Patrick Mahomes. You're telling me they wouldn't have done this deal? Why not? It sounds like it's going to be less money, right? I mean, there's almost no way, unless we win the Super Bowl, that he's going to get as much money as that option. And as far as the next big contract, it's going to happen either way. So why would they not do something that's beneficial for their team? And then you get this nonsense. I'm just so exhausted with this. Gutekunds talked about how Love hadn't played yet, and that's what uh, made the decision difficult. But after three seasons, they've been around him enough to have an idea of who he is as a quarterback, and right now they aren't impressed. What are you talking about? This, this runs entirely contrary to what they've actually told us. They've literally said, we have to see him play, but from what we've seen, we are very impressed. Where do you get this from? From what they've seen, they aren't impressed. Is this still just you banking off of the contract thing? You know this because of the contract situation? So again, there's just no substance here. The Packers don't have any money to go get anyone. A simple Google search could have told you that. And the only other thing you have to go off of is the structure of the contract extension that they gave him makes you believe that they probably don't have confidence in him. He says, the Packers have set themselves up that if Love struggles, I mean really struggles, the team could easily trade off a couple veteran pieces during the season to start giving more snaps to rookies over veterans. Who are you talking about? What, David Bakhtiari? And give snaps to who? What, who else are you talking about? I mean, you, you don't even understand the construction of the, of the roster, apparently. There, there are no veterans starting over rookies right now that need to start. Unless you're talking about, like, Preston and Kenny to get some of those young mid to late round guys so significant snaps but that would be stupid and he says if they start 1 and 4 to look so if they start 1 and 4 they're giving up and they're going to trade everybody away even though they're already tanking but they're just going to tank harder if they're giving up why not just do it now 5 games in they're going to do this and again what is this based on on what nothing are the packers targeting Caleb Williams and the first overall pick Again, it's hard to imagine the Packers being that bad, but this team could easily win just four or five games and be in prime position to select Drake May or one of the other top quarterbacks that would be part of the 2024 draft class. That's how it ended. No, they aren't targeting anyone in the draft. They, they didn't target anyone necessarily in the 2023 draft. They certainly aren't targeting somebody in May in the 2024 draft. That would be silly. And the idea that they traded away Aaron Rodgers so that they can finally start the guy that Brian Gutekunst drafted when, when they very clearly have seen major progress in Jordan Love. And they drafted, what, six receivers and two tight ends in the last two years. And they just paid a decent chunk of money, which, by the way, there's another option here. They could have just declined his option if that was the plan, right? I mean, let's be honest. You just said they have no confidence in him. They're tanking the season. Why would you pay him a big contract? Why would you do that? Just decline the option. But he's finally going to get his opportunity, and they're going to tank the season. And the way that they're going to tank the season is not what? Sign Chauncey Gardner-Johnson? That's going to be how they tank the season, as opposed to like going all in on the season, or what? What are we talking about here? What are we talking about? By the way, I could say the exact same thing about you. <laughs> are you kidding me? What have you done? You guys had, like, what, $100 million in cap space? You signed a guard and two linebackers? Sounds to me like you're all tanking. Because there's no way that's the best that you could do. You added no actual real players. You harvested a low-end wide receiver one in a trade for your first-round pick. You didn't acquire any offensive linemen in free agency, any wide receivers, any tight ends. 
you you gave away David Montgomery, which I'll, I don't understand. You had plenty of money to pay the guy. He's a very good football player, but you decided to just give him away. Didn't replace him in free agency. You didn't get any pass rushers, any defensive tackles, any corners, all very important positions that you, you desperately need. You didn't get any of them. You got two overpaid linebackers and a guard. You did get a guard. I said no offensive lineman. You got a guard. Congratulations. Is it therefore safe to assume, considering you squandered all that money and got nothing for it, that you're not actually trying to win and improve? Um, you know, considering you were the worst team in football, you would expect a little bit uh, more from that. Is, is this just you pretending to do something and spending money in such a way that, that now that it's gone, you could say, at least I did something, when really, obviously, you're not going to improve whatsoever because you're trying to tank for a quarterback next year? Is that, is that what we're doing here? I, 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 are the Packers tanking is the dumbest possible thing ever. No, the Packers are not tanking. Is there a scenario in which Jordan Love doesn't play well and the Packers have to move in a new direction? Yes. Are they already acting on that? No. Are they sabotaging Jordan Love by giving him absolutely no help? Which again, many Bears fans believe the Bears actually did. They sabotaged the team so that they could tank, which of course is a convenient excuse for why you suck so bad. No, because that's not a thing real teams do, including the Bears last year. They didn't sabotage anybody. They didn't do any of that stuff. They didn't. And neither are the Packers this year. They're absolutely not doing that. So that's ridiculous. They're not sitting on $50 million just watching all the free agents fly by. They're not sitting on $20 million watching the free agents fly by. They don't have any money. Never cease to give me more and more reasons to laugh at the Chicago Bears and their fans, I swear. And then uh, as far as the Green Bay Packers, it uh, would appear that Mason Crosby's wife has put on Twitter something to the effect that uh, he will not be returning. I had kind of mentioned that that was going to be a thing for quite a while, and I think we all probably should have, even if I hadn't said it, once we drafted a kicker, probably probably could put two and two together. But Mason's wife did uh, post something on Twitter, which I believe she later edited, but, you know, it alluded to them leaving. So and then the biggest news of the day, the Green Bay Packers signed Jonathan Owens. There is a lot of optimism about Jonathan Owens. Um, I will say, well... Simone Biles is his wife, which seems to be the biggest news of this whole situation, which I'll admit is, is a, a fun and interesting tidbit. I don't know if it deserves quite the amount of attention it's received, but it's, it's a fun footnote. It is funny, I'm looking at a, a news aggregator right now, and I just typed in Jonathan Owens, and I'm trying to find how many articles reference Jonathan Owens on Green Bay Packers articles, right? These are sports articles, not, not just... Uh, Anyways, how many of them reference Jonathan Owens signing with the Packers and do not mention Simone Biles? Pretty sure that's how you say her name. Let's see. Jonathan Owens, husband of Simone Biles. Nope, that doesn't work. Uh, let's see. Nope, not that one. Here's another one. Um, nope, it's got her on there. This one has her on there. Let's see. What to know about Jonathan Owens, the Green Bay Packers' new safety and husband. Oh, nope, shoot. Uh, some of these just straight up say um, Simone Biles' husband. Uh, this one's uh, Yahoo says it, Pop Culture says it, Mail Online, Packer signed former Houston Texan safety. Hey, Mail Online, there we go. We got one. We got one. Is there two? Do I have two? This one, nope. This one, nope. This one, nope. This one, nope. So it looks like one out of about, uh, gee, I don't know. Oh, wait, here's another one. What to know? Packers add to safety depth signing Jonathan Owens from Dairyland Express. But anyways, again, the biggest news seems to be uh, who her wife is, who his wife is. But as far as the information on Jonathan Owens, look, I mean, either he's going to be the next Devondre Campbell, or he's just not a super good football player. That's sort of where it stands right now. But 28 years old, 5'11", 210. At 28 years old, by the way, um, he didn't take his first snaps until 2020. And by first snaps, I mean 10. In 2021, that went up to 168, and then for the first time last year, he actually got to play as a starter. As a starter with the Houston Texans, uh, 970 snaps, he had a 48.3 grade, 45.9 run defense grade, and a 49 coverage grade. 
He was targeted 36 times, 23 of those were caught for 360 yards. He gave up three touchdowns and had three pass breakups, 124.8 passer rating when targeted. The one um, very obvious standout um, aspect of his game is his tackling. And and in this past year, he had an 80.9 tackling grade. Now, he still had a couple games that were pretty putrid um, in which he missed a tackle. But overall, solid tackler. He also had a uh, over a 9 RAS. I don't remember exactly what it was, 9.5 or something RAS. So very athletic guy within the Packers' budget, good tackler. And um, anybody that doubts the Green Bay Packers' ability to find guys that have not performed at a high level to come in and perform at a high level, um, especially on defense, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you've been paying attention to. But I don't have anything else to go on other than yeah, he's bad, but other guys were bad too and became good. But, you know, with all things considered, with the Green Bay Packers' safety situation far from settled, I don't see any reason not to bring him in and at least see what he can contribute. Seems to me most people are just assuming he's an automatic starter. I don't see why that would be the case, but he will certainly come in and compete. And if nothing else, he's got a decent special teams record. Um, The last three years he's played He's actually played the last four years on special teams, the last three years at a pretty high clip, and all three of those last three years, he's graded out fairly well. Not not super high, but, um, you know, mid-60s or whatever, which is, you know, for special teams, not terrible. In fact, the second half of last year, he was really solid on special teams as far as his grades are concerned. So, um, not a lot of downside to it. No reason to really overly hype this unless you personally watched him and, and liked him for some reason. But again, PFF really does not care for him very much at all. But uh, again, as we've all learned, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. And we'll just see what he can do once he gets out there. Oh, and a deal got done on the Washington Commanders. Who cares? Can we just dissolve that freaking franchise? It's such. It's, I don't even like looking at it. I didn't like them when they were the Redskins. I despised them when they were the football team. Yes, I mean, just the fact that I even have to say when they were the football team, dumbest freaking thing ever. I know it was probably stupid on purpose, but still, just hated it. And now, as much as I don't necessarily have anything against the name Commanders in and of itself, it's just that that stupid burgundy and yellow looking, it's just, I don't, like, that team is just so boring, you know? And they're not even, like, super bad to where you look at them like the Jets, and it's at least interesting how much they suck all the time. Like, they have such a long history of being just garbage. They're just, they're they're bad, but they're not terrible, and they're just there, and they're annoying, and I don't, they're, they're kind of like the Chargers for me. Granted, they have Herbert now, so that's supposed to be a thing, but they're still just not a thing, so it's like, I just, they're so just dumb and annoying, and I don't know why they exist. But anyways, yeah, somebody's going to actually buy that, so that's cool. Anyways, why don't we go ahead and take a break right here. Patreon.com forward slash pack underscore daddy. If you'd like to support the podcast, we'll take a break. We'll be right back. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. I'm Alex Rodriguez. And I'm Jason Kelly. From Bloomberg, this is The Deal. Each week, you will hear us in conversation with business icons. This show will explore deal making across sports, media, and entertainment. That is a harsh lesson in business. Sports is not as uh, simple as bringing a bunch of big names together. I didn't want to do another stomp you out speech. It opened up so many more doors. The show is called The The Deal. Deal. Listen to The Deal. Listen to The Deal on Spotify. Hey there. Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. 
And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Hi, so one thing that um, seems very basic but we haven't actually touched on is the question of what is the Green Bay Packers roster going to look like? Um, Again, it seems obvious and it seems basic, but when you look at it, it, it really isn't. You know, there's massive questions at wide receiver. There are questions at offensive line. There are questions at tight end. Um, the the defensive line in terms of who plays where, what, who, where, why. So I at least want to touch on it. And, and look, it's, it's, it's just a pure guessing game at this point, but I want to give you my guesses because I think it'd be kind of fun. Um, so obviously quarterback is going to be Jordan Love. The question of, and I had somebody ask me this. I don't remember exactly who it was. Maybe it was Packing After Dark. I don't know. Sean Clifford or Danny Etling as the number two quarterback. Now, this would assume, I suppose, that there were... Th- well, I, I guess that's not even necessarily true. I was going to say it assumes that there's three because obviously they're not going to cut Sean Clifford, but Sean Clifford could go to the practice squad, um, although he would get probably picked up. So I don't think that that would happen. So let's just assume that they keep three. Who ends up making it as the number two? I would still assume it's Sean Clifford. And the only reason I say that is because if, if Danny Etling was a guy that, let's say, had been with the Packers for two, three, four years, it would be kind of a question mark to me. Because if you're the hold the clipboard guy and we need you to to make sure that Jordan Love is in the right spot and all that, I would think that the guy who's been in the system for a long time would would probably have the upper hand. Um, Now, Danny Etling has been in the NFL for a while, so there's still that question. But I think with all the other variables mixed in, the the number one being, you know, one of these guys probably going to be either let go or practice squad, and, and they don't want Sean Clifford to get drafted in the fifth round and then picked up. Now, who would actually pick him up off the practice squad? I don't know. Maybe that's not even a concern. But I, I would just assume, even if it's two quarterbacks, it's going to be Jordan Love and then Sean Clifford. But it is pretty a, a, a relatively tall task. And, and for, well, first of all, there's what I'm sure a lot of people would object is, you know, we need to stop with the hold the clipboard talk because if Jordan Love goes down, we're actually going to need somebody. <sighs> Look, I... <laughs> I don't think there is necessarily somebody that's going to be able to come in and, and, and fix things. I think this is a very similar situation to Aaron Rodgers where if if our guy goes down, the season's over. Um, now, we don't know what Jordan Love can do anyways, but the bottom line is Jordan Love is either the guy and if he gets hurt, it's over, or he's not and the season's over either way. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to, you know, I, I was okay with the whole Matt Ryan thing and I'm I'm not opposed to any of that kind of stuff, but I'm I'm just going based off of what it seems like things are right now, and that's what it seems like it is. And it's not to say they aren't going to try to develop Sean Clifford into a capable quarterback, but I think that they got a guy that that uh, maybe has more between the between the ears than he does. Um, I was trying to be creative, but but in his arm, and I think that that is going to be his role, and I do think that that's going to be the guy running back. I think the assumption is Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, and Lou Nichols. I don't necessarily know that. I know that we have taken guys in the seventh round that I have been excited about in the past that didn't necessarily become studs. I mean, Kylan Hill was just two years ago. He's gone. I've been wanting to look this up for a while now, but the year that we got uh, the three running backs, Jamal, Aaron Jones, and Devontae Mays, Devontae Mays might have been my favorite of that group. I really like Devontae Mays, and for similar reasons that I like uh, Lou Nichols. But... Devontae Mays didn't really pan out. So we can't just assume that automatically he's going to be the guy. Tyler Goodson and Patrick Taylor have got some experience. And um, as much as they would like to turn to the newer batch of guys, because we'd rather see what we've got in, for example, Lou Nichols, than to continue on with Tyler Goodson or Patrick Taylor when we know what we have in them. But we also know that we can, to some degree, rely on some of these other guys. So I, I honestly, if, if we were to call it 50-50, would say Lou Nichols is, is headed to the practice squad. I could be wrong. Maybe I'm just overly optimistic about Goodson or Patrick Taylor. And maybe with these special teams jobs pretty well locked up as far as return guys, we can focus more on pure running backs. But then that still means Lou's going to have to beat these guys out. And I don't know that he can necessarily as a running back. So I'll just say that it's going to be Jones and Dylan, and then maybe, you know, Patrick Taylor or something. Tight ends, there really isn't much discussion to be had. 
Tucker Craft and Luke Musgrave will be starting along with Josiah DeGuara. Whether or not Tyler Davis also has a spot, I don't know. Wide receiver, um, again, I genuinely believe, you know, well, I guess there's, there's different ways to look at this. How do we start the season and how does the season end? Uh, very possible we start the season with a heavy dose of Watson and Dobbs. I am still of the opinion, and we'll take it so far as to say that by the end of this year, Jaden Reed will be either the number one or number two wide receiver on the team. That's my belief. Now, is somebody going to overtake Romeo Dobbs? I don't think so. I don't believe Samori Turi will. Grant DeBose is a seventh-round pick despite the hype. And Dontavian Wicks, I don't see him as being as good as Romeo. Okay. The, the, first of all, Romeo Dobbs was exceptionally good for a fourth-round pick. He far exceeded my expectations for a fourth-round pick. Dontavian Wicks is a fifth-round pick. So I'm fairly comfortable with the idea that the, the starting wide receivers will be Watson, Dobbs, and Reed, and, and that will be largely the rotation. Now, who's going to also be with them? Well, I think it's going to be Dontavian Wicks, Grant DeBose, and Samori Ture. Now, maybe, you know, I mean, Samori is going to be on the team, and I'm sure Dontavian Wicks is going to be on the team. It's possible Grant DeBose maybe doesn't get the starting nod, but I, I just would assume that he does. That's six wide receivers. I don't think we go with less than yet than that. There's really nobody competing with Grant DeBose that I think is is uh, got a real serious shot. I mean, we'll see what Deuce Watts has and Malik Heath has, but that would be my assumption. The lock starting three, Reed, Dobbs, Watson, and then the backups would be Ture, DeBose, and Wicks. Then you get to offensive line, and everything is pretty well set, presumably with the exception of right tackle. Now, our lads has it as Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins, Josh Myers, John Runyon, and Zach Tom from left to right. I'm starting off with the assumption that it is at, at least the way the Packers view it today, not necessarily who's going to win the competition, but the way that it's put up on their own board today would be David Bakhtiari, Elton Jenkins, Josh Myers, John Runyon, and Yash Nyman. Because Zach Tom has not won any of these jobs yet. But the big question is, will Zach Tom win the job? The other question being, are there any other competitions? Does Sean Ryan possibly have a chance? The, the answer I would probably have there would be no, because again, I think Josh Myers and John Runyon are pretty well established on the roster. The only other question you could have is, is it possible, for example, Elton Jenkins plays right tackle this year, and maybe either Zach Tom or Sean Ryan fill into that guard spot? Obviously, I have fingers crossed that Zach Tom wins the job. No offense to Yash Nyman, but I think we've seen Yash Nyman's ceiling, and um, it would be great to see us break through that ceiling with somebody else, specifically Zach Tom, because I think we know that his ceiling is relatively high. I suppose we should toss Royce Newman's name in the mix here, but I, I feel comfortable assuming that he will not win the job. I mean, he, he couldn't beat out Yash Nyman in previous years at that tackle spot, so I, I don't think he's going to beat out Josh Nyman and Zach Tom this year. There is also Rasheed Walker and Caleb Jones, but again, I just don't think that they're going to end up beating out both of those guys for the job. If they do, fantastic. But I guess I'm going to go ahead and be a pessimist and say that it is Josh Nyman that actually ends up winning the job. Zach Tom will be a backup and a, and a very versatile one that can play either of the tackle roles or either of the guard spot. Defensively, along the defensive line, going to have... Uh, Kenny Clark, Devontae Wyatt, and TJ Slayton likely being the starting defensive tackle group. There are a lot of questions about Lucas Van Ness, Carl Brooks, and Colby Wooden as far as where are they going to line up. I actually think it makes sense to have Colby Wooden and Carl Brooks as defensive linemen, as, as the defensive tackles of the group and not Lucas Van Ness, at least for the, for the sake of just trying to get a, a depth chart set up. Carl Brooks is the one kind of interesting one here insofar as he played a lot of edge rusher and it seems by a lot of people that he would be better as an edge rusher although I don't know that he can actually manage that due to his lack of athleticism but at nearly 300 pounds I think it makes sense it also makes sense just from the standpoint of that would essentially if we add Jonathan Ford give us the six defensive tackles which I think is a pretty solid group there are two undrafted free agents in Jason Lewan and Antonio Moultrie but I'm just going to assume that it's going to be those six. So you've got Wyatt, Slayton, and Clark as our starting guys. Then you'll have the rookies, Wooden and Brooks. 
along with John, Jonathan Ford as your rotational backup guys. Then that leaves off the edge. You got Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith as your starters, and Lucas Van Ness and Kingsley Anigbare as your rotational backups. Now, is Lucas Van Ness going to be playing along the defensive line? Absolutely. Will it be primarily? I don't know, maybe. But I do think he's going to be listed as an edge rusher. After that, no real sweeping um, guesses as far as who stays or who's go- who goes. Um, Jonathan Garvin, Justin Hollins, Ladarius Hamilton. And then we've also got Keyshawn Banks, Kenneth Odumegwu, and Brenton Cox also on there. Um, again, no real thoughts on that. I know a lot of people are excited about Brenton Cox. You know, locker room issues. Not great as far as as PFF goes. I mean, he was fine, but he, he didn't exactly light things up. He wasn't uh, he wasn't Carl Brooks. Uh, other people are excited about uh, Kenneth Odomegwu. Again, I'm not super confident that he's going to end up making a a big impact. So, you know, assuming we go outside of those four, I would just look to Hamilton or Garvin to be again one of the guys. Maybe Justin Hollins. I don't know. It does it doesn't really matter. The bottom line is I think these are going to be our starting four, as you would imagine. Linebacker, again, nothing super interesting. Quay Walker, Devondre Campbell are going to be our starting guys. Um, I'm relatively confident. Well, I'm not relatively. I'm perfectly confident with Eric Wilson staying. Um, He'll be on as a backup, but primarily as a really solid special teamer. Beyond that, though, it does get interesting. We got Isaiah McDuffie, who made the cut last year, but we also have Tariq Carpenter, who they moved to linebacker. Now, I wonder if that is essentially the Packers borderline giving up on Tariq Carpenter and saying, let's just give him a shot over there, because especially with as crowded as it is at safety, with Savage, Ford, Moore, Owens, Johnson, Levitt, Wiggins, and Sapp, I, I, I feel like it's one of those moves where before we get rid of the guy, let's move him over here. Now, it could just be, you know, hey, he, he was kind of a safety slash you know some people thought he'd be a better linebacker anyways so maybe they just feel that this is the right move for him and and it'll actually end up helping him i don't know but i see this as devondre campbell quay walker and eric wilson and then it's going to be a competition between Tariq carpenter isaiah mcduffie and jimmy phillips who is an undrafted free agent this year as far as who i expect to win it uh i'm i'm a little bit torn i i I never really had super high hopes for Tariq carpenter and he didn't really, really uh, have that breakthrough special team season that some people were hoping. But that picture of him as a kid wearing a Packer shirt is hard to get out of my head. So it's hard to not pull for him. With that said, I, the, Isaiah McDuffie certainly had some flashes, and um, I feel like there could actually be some potential there. But I would love it if Tariq Carpenter got moved to linebacker, and it turns out that he is just an absolute, you know, stud as far as, far as backups go, and ends up being a great fit there. Corner is super weird. I don't know whether to put Stokes in there or what exactly to do. I I, I kind of assume it's going to be um, Jair, Razul Douglas, and Keyshawn Nixon as our with, with Nixon as our slot guy. And then when Stokes comes back, I assume it's going to be Jair, Stokes, and Razul Douglas in the slot. That's my assumption. I don't really know. But with that said, obviously Keyshawn is not going to be losing his job anytime soon. So that's four. But we got a bunch of other guys. We got Shamar Jean Charles, who was a fifth round pick, still has not really made uh, a massive impact. Corey Ballantine is still sitting there. Innis Gaines, Keandre Thomas, a lot of names that we've become familiar with. And then we added Carrington Valentine. I don't have any strong feelings one way or another toward uh, a lot of these guys. I know some of them had some pretty good camps and whatnot, but I think it all goes to zero. And we'll see how these camps move forward this year. I do tend to think guys like Carrington Valentine have an upper hand over some of the guys that have been here for a while and, and have not really been able to take a step. Guys like Ennis Gaines and whatnot. It's a second year for Keandre Thomas. If, if Valentine is even on sort of an even tier with those guys, I have to assume they would go in his direction. Um, and as far as Shamar, I really don't know. I mean, he was a fifth round pick. So I tend to think they're probably going to keep him around unless it just unless they've determined that it's just not going to be a thing with him. In which case, and he will end up obviously getting cut. Safety then, I, I have it as, as of right now, Darnell Savage and Rudy Ford. I don't think Savage is getting moved, and I don't necessarily think he's going to lose his job. So in my opinion, that's who's going to be one of the starters. The question then is who starts next to him, and I think Rudy Ford really showed some stuff last year. And I think that makes the most sense. There is Tavarius Moore. There is Jonathan Owens that we just picked up. There is Anthony Johnson that we just drafted. 
Dallin Levitt, who I think is mostly just a special teams guy, and then James Wiggins, and then Benny Sapp, who we picked up as an undrafted free agent. Now, if we assume there's four, which there could be more, but if there's four, who would it end up being? You'd have Savage, you'd have Ford, and then the ones that stand out to me is rookie Anthony Johnson, Jonathan Owens, who we just signed, and Dallin Levitt as a special teamer. And that would leave out Tervarius Moore. So, I mean, there's, there's some guys here that if you were to just ask me, do you think this person makes the team, I'd say yes. But I would end up saying yes more times than I think there are slots. Because right now there's about six guys that I feel comfortable that are going to win the job. So maybe I shouldn't feel so comfortable. But as far as who I feel most comfortable with, I mean, honestly, I think Dallin Levitt might be the most comfortable. I just don't think they're getting rid of him as a special teamer. I think he's maybe like the leader on special teams, with the exception of, you know, punter, maybe, Pat O'Donnell. But um, that might be uh, after the starting two who I'm most comfortable with. And then after that would be Jonathan Owens, just because we just signed the guy. But that would even leave out rookie Anthony Johnson, who some people think could start this year. So... I don't know. That one, to me, safety is largely straight up in the air. Now, are there any options with Darnell Savage? Is it possible the guy is not on the team uh, because he gets let go or or however that could possibly work out? I don't know. But um, hopefully they don't really care about the fact that he's a first-round pick and and whoever's best ends up playing. And then special teams, obviously, Pat O'Donnell is going to be the punter. Uh, Very little reason to believe that Anders Carlson won't be the kicker. I'm very confident that Keyshawn Nixon will be our kick returner. The question is, will he also be our punt returner, or is it possible somebody like Jaden Reed could end up taking that spot? Um, I'm actually going to guess that it's Keyshawn Nixon. I think Jaden Reed's a pretty talented guy. I don't know if he can be a great punt returner in the NFL. I don't know how he's going to perform, and I also think they're going to want him to focus on being a wide receiver and developing in that way. So I think maybe taking that off his plate and trusting a guy like Keyshawn, who we know can get the job done probably is the best way to go about that so that's kind of just where i'm at right now there's a lot of question marks but if you were to just ask me straight up that's sort of where i'm at least leaning on all these things now we'll see as as uh camp rolls around and how these all get sorted out but that's where i'm at right now well that did not take as long as i expected but that is all i was planning on mentioning so (laughs) i'm actually gonna wrap it up you guys have a good rest of your day i will talk to you tomorrow have a good morning